Hello, my name is William Rush Dunton Jr., and I have been referred to as the father of occupational therapy. No, well, I'm quite flattered by the title. I would have to point out that many others contributed to the development of the field, both before and after me. Anyway, what follows is a brief history of the greatest of all professions. Sorry, I just like it when they make my voice do that. But come with me, won't you, as we discover the practice of occupational therapy throughout time. Now, before the words occupational and therapy were ever put together, there were some important folks who were part of a movement known as moral treatment movement. This moral treatment model believed that all people are entitled to compassion. This uh, should be obvious enough, I would think, but apparently they had to have some kind of a movement to drive the point home. One of the first activists for this cause was Philippe Pinel, who took over an insane asylum after the French Revolution and was the first to use organized programs of activity and occupation in such institutions. Next, there were a couple of important Quakers who sowed the oats for early OT. Get it? Quakers? Oats? Oh, never mind. Anyway, in York, England, a Quaker named William Took founded a place called the York Retreat in 1796. At this facility, he too began to implement the moral treatment approach. Across the pond, as they say, Benjamin Rush, another Quaker, also promoted moral treatment, demonstrating that establishing a structure and engaging in simple work tasks promoted better health. Not only was he the first to do this in the United States, he was also a signer of the Declaration of Independence and has been called by many the father of American psychiatry. From about 1880 to 1910, another movement called the Arts and Crafts Movement really took hold. Many people at the time thought that industrialization was a really bad thing. These folks pushed the idea that doing things with their own two hands was a healthier practice than letting a machine do it. Dr. Herbert Hall adapted this approach in his treatment of patients. He started a pottery, weaving, and carpentry workshop to treat hysteria, neurosis, and neurasthenia, a condition which today we call chronic fatigue syndrome. Dr. Hall twice received grants from Harvard, his alma mater, to assist in the study of the treatment of neurasthenia through progressive and greater manual occupation, i.e. they did stuff to feel better. George Edward Barton was the one who actually coined the term occupational therapy. As someone who had endured tuberculosis, a foot amputation, and paralysis, he actually used this idea of therapeutic occupation on himself. He later opened an arts and crafts workshop in Clifton Springs, New York, by the name of Consolation House. It was to that very place he invited me and a handful of other like-minded individuals to meet on March 15th, 1917. We got together, had a right good time, a little punch, and while we were at it, went ahead and formed the National Society for the Promotion of Occupational Therapy. But it was George Barton who set the whole thing up. By George, it was by George Barton that OT as a bona fide field of practice came to be. So, who else was there that day besides good old George and me, eh? Well, there was Eleanor Clark Slagle. She is known as the mother of occupational therapy. Now, just for the record, while she and I have been called the mother and father of the profession, we were not married. And besides the field of OT, we had no other children. <laughs> At least, none that I know about. <laughs> Boom, chicka, wow, wow. <laughs> anyway, Eleanor was a lovely woman with a keen interest in what was known as the mental hygiene movement, which was going on around the turn of the century. She was originally a social worker who went back to school to take a course in curative occupation and never looked back. She promoted the idea of habit training, which sought to replace lost or bad habits with new positive ones. Also in attendance for that first meeting was Thomas Bessel Kidner. 
Tom recognized early on the connection of occupational therapy with vocational rehabilitation. By way of his position as vocational secretary of the Canadian Military Hospitals Commission, he designed workshops architecturally into institutions for the physically disabled. In other words, he built the buildings with OT in mind. Susan Cox Johnson was there at that Constellation House event too. Susan was an arts and crafts teacher who worked to adapt crafts to help the sick and disabled in their recovery. In 1916, she began teaching occupations for invalids and pushed her whole life to promote well-trained and educated practitioners in the field. One person who couldn't be there that day was Susan Tracy. She was a nurse and wrote the very first book about occupational therapy in 1910 called Studies in Invalid Occupations. Before that, in 1906, as the director of the training school for nurses at the Adams Nervine Asylum in Boston, she also developed the first structured training course that prepared students to teach patient activities. If Eleanor and I are the so-called parents of our profession, then Susan would have to be the mother of OT education. Although she wasn't there for our meeting, we voted her in as an inaugural member anyway. Oh, and I almost forgot, Isabel Newton. She was there for that first get-together as well. She was George Barton's secretary at the time, but would eventually become his wife. I thought they were looking at each other a little wistfully that day. Isabel also worked side by side with George in teaching occupations to the disabled. And then there's me, William Rush Dunton Jr. Just like everyone else there that day, I felt very strongly about the therapeutic value of occupations. Working as a psychiatrist at the Shepherd Asylum in Baltimore, I found myself supremely disheartened by the absence of effective treatments for the mentally ill. I wanted to be part of a solution, and I thought I might just know how to do it. So, I started a course for nurses that showed them how to use arts and crafts as a means for habit training. Oh, and I wrote a few books too, like uh, Occupation Therapy, A Manual for Nurses, and Prescribing Occupational Therapy, and so on and so forth. It needs to be said, though, that the six of us there that fateful day in 1917 shared a great vision. We called ourselves the National Society for the Promotion of Occupational Therapy, but that name didn't last long, thank goodness. By the time 1921 rolled around, we changed it to the name it still has today. The American Occupational Therapy Association. Regardless of the title, though, the focus has remained the same. We strive to utilize people's innate desire to do, to help them be who they need and want to become. Now, the next important influence on OT was a man with whom I'd previously worked, Dr. Adolf Meyer. He essentially provided our field with its philosophical base. He believed in the psychobiological approach, which was the holistic perspective we really needed. In the end, his book, The Philosophy of Occupational Therapy, still guides us to this day. Thank you, Dr. Meyer. The same year our Consolation House meeting was held, the United States entered World War I. And immediately, as is the sad case with war, there were injured and disabled servicemen. At Walter Reed Hospital in Washington, D.C., they began to train nurses as reconstruction aides. Under the direction of reconstruction aides, disabled soldiers were taught the skills of metalwork, woodworking, weaving, block printing, wood carving, and toy making as part of their rehabilitation. So it was Uncle Sam himself who validated the idea of activity as therapy on a national level. In 1918, Congress passed the Soldiers' Rehabilitation Act, which essentially codified the already existing programs of vocational rehabilitation for injured servicemen. This was soon followed by the Civilian Vocational Act, which authorized federal funds to rehabilitate non-service members. This growth in OT continued until the Great Depression. Occupational therapy departments closed. Entire schools closed. 
As a result, AOTA membership declined significantly over the next 10 plus years. Upon the United States' entry into World War II, however, demand for OTs again skyrocketed. There were still a few accredited schools out there, but the program took 18 months to complete, and we needed more OTs now. In response, the Army implemented war emergency classes to expedite occupational therapy training. And those rigorous four-month courses churned them out. In just under four years, military OT personnel increased over 7,000%. Most of the big news for OT over the next few decades came in the form of legislation. And I mean a lot of legislation. In 1963, the Community Mental Health Act led to a policy of deinstitutionalization. Medicare was signed into law in 1965. The Rehabilitation Act of 1973 meant that the most severely disabled get services first, and it also assured civil rights for those with disabilities. The Education for All Handicapped Children Act of 1975 mandated mainstreaming in classrooms and also specified OT as a related service in schools. Also in 1975, the Hill-Burton Act was amended to become the Public Health Service Act. President Reagan signed Social Security Amendments into law in 1983, which established the prospective payment system and created diagnosis-related groupings. The Handicapped Infants and Toddlers Act of 1986 made intervention services available from birth and designated OT as a primary service. The Technology-Related Assistance for Individuals with Disabilities Act of 1988 made assistive technology devices and services available. The Americans with Disabilities Act was passed in 1990. The Education for All Handicapped Children Act was reauthorized in 1991 as the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act IDEA. The Balanced Budget Act of 1997 sought to reduce Medicare spending. Since the 1990s, occupational therapy has continued to progress. The AOTA has strengthened their lobbying efforts regarding OT-related legislation and also set down permanent physical routes with a big shiny HQ building in Bethesda, Maryland. The OTJR exists to document a research emphasis in OT. A separate entity, NBCOT, was formed to oversee certification. Nowadays, there is a concerted effort to return to our roots, so to speak, and remember what I and the other five at that first meeting in 1917 sought to do. Utilize the compassion of the moral treatment movement. Work to ensure our practitioners are well-educated and always believing that sick minds, sick bodies, sick souls may be healed through occupation. <laughs>